evening, afternoon, I should say. I almost missed the night tonight's meeting because I thought it was starting at seven, um, but I'm glad we're here. Uh, it's June 26, calling to order the school committee meeting. I'm just gonna read this statement quickly. This meeting is being held in person and or remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to chapter two of the acts of 2023 and all other applicable laws temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Ham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Master Mala, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other particip participants of said recording. We have um, Harvard Media recording and we have Zoom on and recording as well. Um, is anybody else recording? No? Okay. Um, I wanted to let you know that we have two members participating remotely, um, Michelle Ayer and Carrie Nee and the remaining uh, committee members are here. Um, and if you will um, allow me to move something up on the agenda, it's um, item 7.2, it's the evaluation of the superintendent. I was gonna just move that up now so that we can get Michelle's time while she's still here as she needs to jump off by 5.30. Is that everybody okay with that? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so um, Dr. Adams has been here for a year. We're so grateful for her time. Um, she uh, is lucky enough to have the first evaluation in public since 2020, um, because we haven't, haven't, haven't had the opportunity to do one since then. Um, I, the, process, the way that the process worked this year is I received the um, feedback from the committee members and given Michelle is the uh, vice chair and she was the chair last year and worked with Margaret, um, Dr. Adams one-on-one, -on -one, I had her work with me on um, compiling your information I have submitted a summary form in the packet as well as the form that is required by the state. Um, so you can you can take a look at that, but I thought I would hit on the high levels here. Um, and um, then I guess at the end, we'll have to vote on uh, where we ended up. So um, based on the evaluation provided, is it is evident that Dr. Adams is regarded as an intelligent, thoughtful and effective leader who prioritizes the needs of students. She has displayed several attributes of a successful leader, including being a diligent worker, demonstrating commitment to the staff and the community, and introducing improved processes and communication within the Hingham Public School System. One notable achievement of Dr. Adams is her ability to assemble a strong central office team that has provided stable leadership during challenging times such as the aftermath of the global pandemic and previous leadership changes. She has also emphasized the importance of innovation and data-driven approaches to education, benefiting both students and staff. She has actively sought feedback from the community, educators, and students through surveys, focus groups, and presentations to ensure a comprehensive understanding of the district's needs. Her regular updates, such as weekly emails and improved communication from principals to each school, have been appreciated by stakeholders and have helped keep everyone informed. Dr. Adams' entry process into her role as superintendent was commendable, considering the challenges the district was facing. She successfully navigated through obstacles, such as a special town meeting for a building project, working with new leadership team, and addressing substantial budget needs that resulted in a tax override. These achievements demonstrate her exemplary leadership skills. Furthermore, Dr. Adams has shown proficiency in leadership by maintaining momentum, promoting professional development, fostering relationships with stakeholders, and addressing areas in need of improvement identified through the strategic plan. Her proactive approach, commitment to equity, and focus on collaboration set a positive path for the continued progress of the district. Overall, the evaluation highlights Dr. Adams' remarkable first year as superintendent and the positive impact she has made on the Hingham Public School System. Her leadership skills, dedication to the community, and ability to overcome challenges make her a valuable asset to the district. So at the beginning of the year, uh, Dr. Adams had set her goals um, for the first year, which were approved by the school committee that happened in the summer, late summer. Um, and then as far as the ratings go, I just thought I would um, talk through them. So there's the assessing progress towards goals. 
for her professional practice goal, she met expectations. For her student learning goal, she met expectations. And for her district improvement goal, she exceeded expectations. When discussing the performance on standards, there are four standards. Um, the instructional leadership, um, she was rated proficient, management and operations, exemplary, family and community engagement proficient, and professional cultural, uh, professional culture proficient. And she um, received an overall summative performance of proficient. Um, so that's all I had to share. I'm not sure if you want to add anything, Dr. Adams. I know you and I had discussed, um, but I, I think it is a very successful um, first year superintendent and you had a lot going on um, in the district with all of those changes. So we're, we're grateful. Yeah, I think we would be remiss not to thank the members of the leadership team. I think we've said before, I think Katie said um, in another meeting, we're all committed to each other's success um, and I'm grateful for their commitment to my success. Um, we overcame quite a few challenges this year um, with grace, with a lot of hard work and perseverance and resiliency. Um, and I'm very proud of the team that we have as well as the educators who welcomed me into their classrooms, the students with great big smiles um, and questions when I asked and were able to answer the questions when I asked them, you know, what are you doing? And, um, and their great smiles. I'm very proud of all that we've accomplished. The members of the community too, who I think that um, when folks, um, when I first started, folks said that this was a very warm and welcoming community. And I have certainly experienced that warmth and generosity of spirit um, and we've certainly seen that in display all year long. So I'm super grateful. I think I've been successful only because of the success of others. Um, so I really am grateful to all of their hard work. And I think it exemplifies um, the great strides we've made and our potential to keep doing great work. Thank you. Um, Michelle, since you um, helped me work on this, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, yes, I want to thank everybody on the committee for all their great comments. Um, I thought it was a really robust and really um, helpful compilation of information that everybody provided. All the comments that were included, Dr. Adams, were very complimentary. Um, been a really, really successful first year, and we're really grateful for you being with us. All right, with that, um, does somebody want to make a motion to? approve the um, superintendent evaluation for the year. I'll make a motion. Right. Never get time. <laughs> All right, I'll make a motion to approve Dr. Adams' initial um, evaluation of her superintendency for the Ingham Public Schools with an overall rating of proficient. And I will second. And since we are on Zoom, I'm gonna do a roll call. Um, so Matt. Hi. Allie. Hi. Tim. Hi. Jen. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Carrie. Aye. And I'm an eye as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for joining by Zoom, Michelle. <laughs> and Carrie. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. You. I want to do the hand well. Congratulations, Dr. Adams. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, and I'm also grateful for the feedback of the, through the process. Um, we're all works in progress, and we certainly want to model for our staff setting goals and working towards them and continuing to grow. And I'm committed to doing that as well. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we're going to move one more thing up, if you don't mind, um, the handbooks so that we can get these fine people out on their, uh, their evening. Um, so it is 7.1. Um, Dr. Adams, I'm not sure how you want to start. Yep. So in your packet, um, we've provided um, the principles of giving you an overview of the changes that they're making to the handbooks, um, as well as the handbooks include the updates to the three policies that the non-discrimination, sexual harassment, and I know there's one more, um, that they updated the, their school handbooks. And in addition to any changes that have come up throughout the year um, that we've noticed needed updating, I think the handbooks are something, and you'll see in the equity audit, there's some feedback about the handbooks. Um, the handbooks are gonna have to be something that we continue to work on and improve um, and thinking about how we provide that information to the community and use it as a tool for communication. 
Um, but I think that, you know, we need to approve them so that we can use them for the beginning of the start of the school year. And it's just going to have to be an ongoing process as we continue to um, update them and, and make them as user friendly. Um, we still have much work to do, um, but this is this is where we are for this at this point at this time. So I'll invite Matt to come up to sort of summarize those uh, changes in the elementary handbook, which aren't many. See if I can count correctly. We have uh, six, uh, five, five items that we updated. We updated the student's attendance policy in the handbook to reflect district uh, district policies. Um, we updated our homeschooling section of the handbook to uh, define, we needed to define what enrichment meant. Uh, there, it was open to interpretation without that definition. Uh, we updated the non-discrimination policy uh, to reflect language and current practices per school committee policy. Uh, we updated the sexual harass harassment policy to reflect language in the school committee policy. And then harassment of students was updated to ref reflect current practices as well. Anybody have any questions? Well, it seems like if we stopped updating policies, you <laughs> wouldn't have to update the handbooks. <laughs> I can't I apologize. Right. respond to that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You want to do them as a group? Um, yeah. And okay. Then, yeah. Um, Derek, do you want to come up and just highlight um, shortly? All right, I'm going to keep my visit to the podium at one this evening as opposed to the three last time. Um, we don't have too many things to update. Uh, similar to the elementary school, we're updating our harassment of students policy to align with school committee. The sexual harassment policy, we're broadening that so that it includes the language and more specificity that the school committee policy had and the non-discrimination policy has been added. The only other thing that we have in there, um, and you may remember this, one of our students pointed out to the school committee and to the building administration that our, our our handbook lacked clarity when it came to um, students ability to make up work due to absences related to religious observances um, it was always understood it was always communicated to the faculty but never explicitly stated to our, our parents and students so we felt that now was a good time to include that so we did add language um, and I'll just read it to you it's very brief students absent due to the observance of a religious holiday will be given additional time to make up any missed assignments and or assessments. Teachers, students, and parents should communicate in order to determine when work should be completed by. Teachers are encouraged to avoid any major assignments or assessments during these days, if at all possible. Families are welcome to request work in advance of a holiday, and teachers may provide if possible. So that is has been the practice of the middle school, as with all schools, for um, a very long time. But um, it just felt like it, it was is worth um, explicitly stating, especially when pointed out by one of our students and community members that they felt concerned that it wasn't clear enough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll invite Mr. Swanson. He has a f much more significant changes, but. Um... Sorry, there are more points to the high school uh, memo here, actually 18 points. A lot of them are really minor editorial changes, but I wanted to include every one of them just to make sure they were, they were all on your radar screen. Some as simple as uh, point number one, where we're updating uh, a listing of staff members, uh, replacing a couple of people who won't be with us next year. Um, Point number two on the memo is acknowledging a change that was made earlier this year. If you remember, uh, we changed the graduation requirement to allow sophomores to be able to replace physical education with an alternate means. So we're acknowledging that on page seven and eight uh, of the handbook. Uh, that's also connected with uh, point three A, counselors meeting with freshmen and sophomores during PE and or health since uh, there's no longer any guarantee that sophomores would be taking PE. And we know through course requests that most of them actually have, have chosen other electives. So uh, counselors will, will be meeting with sophomores primarily through health classes. We found a few um, typos, so point 0.3b is just a typo there. Uh, on attendance policy number four, there's no change to the policy, but rather just a change to how we're keeping track and documenting those absences 
and no longer wanting to require a physical note on paper, but rather communicating through email from our attendance secretary to parents or guardians and, and acknowledging and documenting those absences that way. So just an updating to how we're doing that. Uh, and point number five, uh, under Saturday school, one is a typo, and then number two, just changing some of the language to Saturday detention rather than Saturday school, and also just allowing a little more flexibility on the consequence. So changing the word will result in two-day suspension to may result in two-day suspension in the hopes that we may be able to, to implement some more restorative stuff and avoid uh, two-day suspension for, for students who missed a Saturday detention. Point number six is um, a continuation really of point number four, but just uh, deleting some of the language again about requiring a paper note as we had traditionally done. So we'd be eliminating a few sentences there. Point number seven is an update. Uh, as we were going through the book carefully this year, we uh, recognized that this Academic Integrity Committee, which existed a long time ago, but, but really has not met in more than a decade, we should probably eliminate that since it's no longer really a viable committee at the school. Um, and actually that's point number eight, rather. Uh, point number seven was similar to what we had done on the Saturday detention, wanting to eliminate a kind of a mandatory uh, sentencing here and, and requiring a zero, but rather saying it would be a failing grade in the hopes that, uh, again, maybe some restorative stuff and an opportunity for students to, to resubmit work. Uh, and point number nine, uh, there's a little bit of a loosening here to the language where we had, we had said in the handbook that food and beverages may not be consumed anywhere other than the cafeteria, recognizing that's, that's actually not really the case in practice. And let's not have rules in the, in the handbook that we don't intend to enforce. So eliminating just a couple of sentences there. Um, and then just moving some language that had been in another place, moving it up there. Uh, we have uh, recognized a, a growing problem with students wanting to make use of DoorDash or Grubhub and uh, send and, and have food delivered. We want to emphasize that we, we can't allow that. It's just um, not possible for the school secretaries to keep uh, up with the <laughs> delivery of those foods. <laughs> uh, so a little bit of, uh, of change there. Point number 10, parking for students. This will be you know, a fairly significant change probably in the, in the daily life to students um, who drive to school. We recognized this year really for the first time that we, we had more students wanting to drive to school than we had available parking spots. So whatever the cause, if it's um, you know, just, uh, just an economic uh, influence of everyone can afford or more people can afford cars than they used to be able to. Um, at the end of the year, we had a number of days where we had um, students. It could have also been sophomores getting their licenses toward the end of the year, but we simply were running out of spots. And so through some discussions about better managing that, we're proposing that the parking spaces now be numbered both in the close lot and in the far lot. And uh, this is following a process. We had surveyed a bunch of other schools in the area and found that a, a significant um, number of them are following a similar approach with good success. We thought this would be a better way of managing it for us so that um, we, we would continue to allow only seniors to buy a spot in the close lot, but um, we would allow the opportunity to purchase those spots through a lottery rather than what we've done now, which is to allow any senior to buy a spot, but it does not guarantee a spot. So a bunch of kids may buy spots and they don't arrive early enough to get them. Uh, and then they're left having to go out to the far lot. Maybe by the time they get to the far lot, there just aren't enough spots anymore. We know now if we manage it this way, um, we're only selling as many placards as we have spots available. We're also suggesting here toward the end that we increase the fee. Uh, it's currently been uh, free to park in the far lot, but we're proposing just a, a um, very minimal fee of $20 for far lot parking. It would cover the cost of painting the spots and also managing it, ordering the placards and so forth. Increasing the close lot fee from $40 to $80, but knowing that now if you have a close lot um, placard, you actually are guaranteed a spot to park there every day as opposed to previously there was no guarantee that you actually could park. You had to arrive early enough. 
also proposing that we increase the number of student spots in the close lot. This is based on a study and monitoring it that we think we can assign an additional uh, 20 spots to students uh, more than we had this year. So uh, those are the they're probably the most interesting changes from the from the whole uh, four page memo. Yeah. Uh, Do Tim? teachers ever have trouble finding the spot? No, luckily, uh, we've reserved enough room in the front for staff, uh, more really than we even needed, which okay. is why I think we, we can allot another, it's actually 19 spots for students. Um, unless it's election day. Right. Yeah, <laughs> unless it's election day, right. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. It's great to be able to allow students to drive to school, but I'd certainly prioritize the teachers. Absolutely, yes. Uh, very good and question. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I that's usually not a worry. Method, um, knowing that this year there was a lot of talk about the sale of the far lot um, stickers and the money was not going to you guys. So I'd rather you know uh -huh. actually come into the school versus yes. some of the shenanigans that were happening right yeah uh good points so thank you for the for those questions um we we think you know well any, anytime there's change it'll generate some discussion maybe some controversy but we think it's actually best for students and it, it just helps us to manage it in a much more orderly manner and uh and prevent the problem of people scrambling for spots we think it may also um improve safety too because people maybe have one less reason to speed to school in the hopes of getting to a spot before they're all gone now they know where their spot is it's assured to them um, and uh, hopefully gives us a more orderly way to, to manage the whole system uh, the remaining changes there's um, there's one here on tardiness to school which just eliminates some language that would no longer be relevant and eliminating a couple of sentences no real change to the policy though under extracurricular activities would be deleting a couple of clubs that are no longer active these were student initiated clubs with volunteer advisors where the interest has waned over the years and, and so those clubs would no longer exist um, we're adding some new sections again uh, just including language from some new school committee policies that were approved in April. So a new section on harassment of students, a new section uh, that includes new language under sexual harassment, adding the non-discrimination language. And um, then point number 16, uh, this on the final page, this was a proposal that I, I guess if, if it were regarded as a positive change uh, would perhaps apply across the board in the other schools handbooks as well. But through some of our discussions, we thought it may be useful to add a line uh, in the code of conduct under Group C violations. There, there are currently nine examples of violations that could lead to consequences. We thought it may be helpful to add a section that would say something like lying or providing false information to school officials. We, we had a few cases this year where we you know, were dealing with students who have presented some false information. There was nothing in the handbook that clearly outlined this as a violation. So you know, clearly it's something that, that ought to have consequences. We could call it disrespect, um, possibly defiance, but we thought it may be helpful to include some language um, that specifically addresses students who provided false information to school officials. Obviously it really complicates some of the investigations that we may be trying to do. Um, the other things, again, are just adding some, some new language or updating names of staff members. And, uh, and that's about it. So that, there's all 18 points. Happy to take any, any questions. Any other questions? Sorry. Okay. We probably should put the fee um, increases on the July 10th meeting agenda and do that as a separate vote so that you're voting on that agenda right. item and those fees separately. So okay. we'll put that on the July 10th with some explanation. Um, right. Sounds good. Great, thanks everybody. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, um, with that, um, we, uh, we have to approve the changes, the updated um, handbooks. Um, we have to go through them individually because they're all named differently. So I will take a motion. Do you want to make sure? Uh, I will start with Alan Tree. So we'll make a motion to approve the proposed changes to the 2023-2024 edition of the Hingham Public Schools Elementary Family Student Handbook. We'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Matt? Aye. Allie? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jen? Aye. 
Michelle? Aye. Carrie? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Thank you. I will make a motion to approve the changes to the 2023-2024 edition of the Hingham Middle School Handbook. I will second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Matt? Aye. Allie? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jen? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Carrie? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. And finally, I'll make a motion to approve the proposed changes to the 2023-2024 edition of the Hingham High School Student Handbook Code, Code of Discipline. I will second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Matt? Aye. Allie? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jen? Aye. Carrie? Aye. Michelle? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, hope thank you, you enjoy the rest of your evening and summer. <laughs> Unless you want to stay to the end. You're welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. As Michelle. Much as you want. I thought Michelle's Michelle, did you want to say something? I know. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I would love to stay to him, but my vacation is coming. So. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so I will go back up. Um, approval of the minutes, two, um, item two is approval of the minutes. We're gonna table that for now. Um, item three is questions and comments. So we set aside 15 minutes to take questions and comments um, for items that are not on tonight's agenda. Um, is there anyone who has any questions or comments? If you can raise your hand. I'll give you a second. No. Okay. All right. So we'll move on um, to item number four, which is the superintendent's report. Um, Dr. Adams. So before we jump into the um, equity audit, which is the primary um, document we want to share with you tonight, um, today, we had a couple of items just of interest, um, some press releases um, that have been shared over the past month. Um, one being um, the after school strings program registration began June 17th and goes through July 1st. Um, remember that we started a pilot um, this year that was highly successful. Um, this is to extend um, the pilot and we're grateful to um, Jackie Sansoni, I know she's online, Aisha um, as well and um, Joanne Bellis for coordinating the expansion next year of the fall sessions. They're 15 weeks in length, one class per week, um, and it'll finish with a class concert. Um, it uh, provides for exposure to um, instruments, enrichment and technique um, for strings instruments, um, and registration is ongoing, and they'll take place at each of the individual schools. So we're excited to expand that opportunity um, to the community, so. The, we were, um, were grateful also to announce the permanent selection of uh, Michelle Romano as the Director of Science. Um, we were grateful again to have her share with the community um, and the leadership team all the work that she had accomplished this year, um, specifically supporting um, our high school expansion of some dual enrollment at the high school, as well as the Open Syed, which you've heard a lot about at the middle school. Um, and we're grateful to have her continue that work into next year um, as well. Um, you had some previous, they're kind of old news, but just sharing with you um, press releases on um, the appointment of um, Barbara Cataldo as our interim Executive Director for Student Services, um, Katie Roberts as the Permanent Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Um, we also were trying to do some outreach on um, new student registration um, with the press as well as providing, um, just trying to clear up clearly where how people go about the registration process. Heather Cashman helped in cleaning up the website to make it a little clearer and easier to find. Um, as well as clearing up, you know, what are those really specific things um, that folks need in order to register um, and just trying to get the word out for folks to make sure if they're enrolling their students for the fall that they can do so and how to do so. Um, in addition, we had um, 37 um, Hingham teachers who were honored by the Plymouth County Education Association um, back in May of 22nd. 22nd 
including um, Donna Fennessy for 35 years of professional service, um, for 30 years of service, um, Karen Breen, Daniel Clune, Paul Donovan, Paula Flanagan, Laurie Grillo, Peter Healy, Mary Beth Lally, Monica Matthews, Cynthia McKeon, and Jonathan Rice. So I think those we can celebrate and honor um, 30 plus years of service um, to education of all of those employees um, as well. So we're gonna, Katie and I are gonna um, team tag the equity audit. Um, you have a full 81 pages of um, documentation that we are gonna try to simplify um, in about 10, 10 to 15 minutes um, for you as well as welcome um, discussion um, on the document. So first, um, we'll tell you a little bit about the process. Um, this was a year long process. We worked with the equity process um, and specifically um, Cindy Weeks Bradley, who's the main consultant at the equity process, um, as she shepherded us through this process. This is sort of a document that outlines what is. Um, so you'll see um, at the end, we sort of give a give glimpse into um, some next steps um, and what we'll be doing and our plans moving forward. But it really was to document um, and give us a fresh perspective from the outside about what's happening and give us some recommendations um, in that we now have to figure out how to use those that information. You're also seeing it, you're know, like one of the first groups to see it. The leadership team hasn't seen it or delved into it too much. Um, so now, as you first have a first view of it, we'll also be digging into it and using parts of it with the leadership team um, and other groups to help inform our work, our professional development work, um, our curriculum work. So there's more work that folks need to do around the document to sort of understand what it shares with us and how do we um, move forward. So a little bit on the process that was used for the equity audit. Um, these, these are the members of the equity task force. Um, that sort of participated all year long in sort of giving feedback and um, sort of revisions and different parts of the plan as the year went on. Um, so the process um, and the purpose of an equity audit, so why do an equity audit? It's sort of to help us um, in our ongoing efforts to sort of think about how do we meet the needs of all of our students and provide a high, high expectations and a welcoming, warm learning environment for all of our students. It helps us think about how this collaboratively as a community, that question about how do we provide for equity and inclusion for all of our students, both now in the present and also as we support students for the future. How do we support our young people to be members of a growing diverse community, both here in Hingham and beyond? Um, as they move forward into career and college um, opportunities. It's based on research. What research says means what is a comprehensive um, um, a learning environment that is welcoming of all students. Um, based upon that research, what are um, the findings and recommendations um, and what are the things that we should be doing in our school environment to support all students? It had three phases. Um, the first phase delved into um, looking at, um, it was sort of like a desk audit of a lot of our written materials, looking at our policies, our procedures, our handbooks, um, our websites, anything that was public facing and written. So it's kind of like a desk audit. That was the first phase. Um, we collected materials and shared um, materials with um, the folks doing the audit. Um, as well, so some forward faces and some, some internal documents that we share. In the second phase was sort of going out and seeking some feedback through surveys and some facilitated discussions um, with diverse community um, and staff members. Um, and then in phase three, sort of sharing the findings and recommendations and getting feedback um, from the equity task force about what, what made sense, what didn't make sense, and what might need a second look. So it went through those three phases um, throughout the year. Um, this, these are some of the data sets that were reviewed as part of the first phase of the audit. You'll see 
um, policies, procedures, um, the superintendent's entry plan, professional development plans, um, materials that have been done in the past in relation to equity. So there was some equity. You would have received a report a couple of years ago about some equity work. So they looked at all of those documents as well. Um, um, human resource materials, um, anything that was publicly um, available um, were some of the data sets. Um, student data as well, MCAS data that was available um, online as well. So the first phase around looking at um, our structures um, and policies, um, feedback that we got, so this, this is some summary. There's a lot more detail um, obviously in the document. Um, but some big picture highlights. Um, the strategic plan is very easy to follow. Um, it sets a roadmap for the district moving forward. Um, the strategic plan is based upon really high expectations, both for our students, our families, and our communities and a district as a whole. Um, and really highlights the values that we have um, as a community. Um, a human resource handbook isn't really in place. The human resources documents that we have are really based upon labor um, and compliance. Um, so that you'll see as a recommendation is sort of how do we create a human resource um, um, department and procedures and policies that go beyond just compliance, but also think about um, the personnel piece around how do we recruit, hire, and re retain our staff as well as looking to diversify our staff um, overall. So, and using the resources that are available statewide to help us do that work. There's some great um, resources that are, and networks that are available that we can tap into to continue to grow um, that piece. So that's um, definitely a piece um, that we need to grow on um, and would be part of um, our next steps. Um, revising the school handbooks um, to be student-centered, you see some feedback in that part that there's um, their, their procedural and their legal documents. Um, there's a great example from another district that's, um, when you first look at it, it's very overwhelming, but it, I think it's a good example for us to aim for, um, and it's something that I think we'll have to, again, keep working on um, as a district every year to say, how do we keep continuing to improve our handbooks as a way, as our first, one of the first ways we communicate to families um, about our expectations, but making sure that the handbook also is inclusive of the values we want to promote as a community. So um, that there's some work to be done also about around that. Um, there's a section on student discipline. Overall, um, it's noted that we have very low um, student discipline reported. So that these are very low numbers of student suspensions and expulsions. However, our data is inconsistent. So we're not clearly, we're not consistently collecting the same data from year to year. Um, we have a new SIMS administrator, um, Mrs. Patel, and um, we're finishing up this year and learning a lot about some of those inconsistencies so that next year um, we can note and have a very clean year of clean data and really clear expectations of what needs to be reported in Aspen and how. Um, so we're cleaning up that data, finding some of those errors, cleaning up them up now, and setting up procedures for next year um, so that we have better data. That said, we still have work to do around drilling down around our high needs. Our high need students tend to be those with discipline referrals, so we need to drill down and see the why and the how. Really believing that if we get our data set right, we can better understand some of that, those discipline and start to look for patterns um, as well. Um, and we talked about creating a system of accountability. Passing on to you for the equity walks. Great, um, another aspect of data that we looked at, um, we did participate um, as a district administrative team in equity walks with the staff from the equity project. Um, so we, as a leadership team, engage in um, uh, learning walks often, and so we're out in classrooms, and we're generally looking at curriculum instruction. Um, the group from the Equity Project had a very different lens, um, really looking at obs observations of relationships, engagement, 
Um, and so again, had a, had a different lens in the learning walks that we were doing. Um, so the equity uh, project um, provided staff um, that did uh, equity walks throughout the district in all six schools, um, visiting classrooms, common spaces, offices, uh, really trying to get um, an overall picture. And so it was um, a single uh, snapshot in time, but we did um, have some interesting um, takeaways from that. Um, so the equity uh, project staff um, left with a general impression of very warm and welcoming elementary uh, school environments. Um, they noted um, that the students um, were had kind of a calm um, and um, kind of um, welcoming um, demeanor to them and noted the high academic standards um, and meaningful learning taking place in our um, elementary classrooms. Um, at the secondary level, they made similar comments around um, the high academic standards, um, around the meaningful learning that was taking place. Um, and it was also noted um, that there were intentional um, efforts at the secondary level um, to have um, inclusive environments, um, both um, uh, in both buildings um, and efforts to represent the cultural diversity um, of students. Um, um, however, they did come away with some recommendations, um, some of which were really low hanging fruit that we were able to get a jump start on um, right away. Um, there was a comment that, um, particularly in our hallways, um, that uh, they made a recommendation that we include some additional visual displays uh, to provide what are known as uh, windows, mirrors, and sliding doors um, for students um, to feel represented and to feel uh, welcome uh, in the physical spaces. Um, there were also some interesting comments just about the setup of our secondary classrooms. Uh, we do have, um, at, particularly at the high school and the older building with very traditional furnishings. And so um, really thinking about how a physical space can drive um, student interaction and student um, engagement. Um, another um, op opportunity, um, they did recommend that we actually include students in those conversations um, in thinking more about the physical design and thinking about how we can use, again, those physical spaces um, to drive um, engagement, interaction, and to really um, foster um, team problem solving. Um, and also um, made a comment, um, this surfaced in the surveys as well, that students generally feel um, safe and included in classroom spaces, um, but they did encourage us to think deeply about some of the other public spaces um, because both in um, their walkthroughs and also in the surveys, um, there was a sense that, that some of the other uh, uh, physical spaces um, outside of the actual physical classrooms um, were areas that we may want to um, think about differently. And I think, too, I would say that as the year progressed, I think coming out of COVID, we still had many classrooms still in rows. And I think as the year has progressed, we've seen some change in the winter into the spring as staff became more comfortable. But still a place that we want to continue to monitor is our spa classroom spaces and how we create collaborative spaces. We also did another round of equity walks with the leadership team, um, just ourselves. Um, where small groups went to a particular school and just did a walkthrough and we did a, a one of every building again. And it's a process we hope to, as our, some of our next steps is just as a team, getting a team of the leaders together and visiting and talking about what we're seeing in classrooms, sort of also to help us calibrate about what we're seeing and, and how we give feedback to teachers as well. So it's a practice we started here, did again ourselves and we'll continue into next year. Great, so in addition to the equity walks, um, we also um, collected, um, uh, the team collected some data uh, through surveys. And the surveys were of students, families, and staff. And it was interesting uh, for us to see where there was consensus um, between students, family, and staff, and where there might have been um, some variation. Um, so that would be an area for us to um, explore further. Um, so it was clear from all three surveys that there was a general sense of students, um, families, and staff um, that uh, curriculum and instruction is impactful um, and um, serves uh, students well in terms of preparation. Um, however, there was um, some um, 
uh, area, areas for growth in terms of promoting more voice and choice um, in, in students, um, particularly I would say at, at the secondary level. So again, there was a comment of, um, you know, kind of very high academic standards, uh, but thinking about that voice and choice. And that is um, very much in um, alignment with the work that we're doing around universal design for learning. Uh, voice and choice is one of the main um, tenants of that. And so some professional development is underway um, to address that. Um, there was also um, some indication in the surveys that we do have some work to do around um, school climate and culture and relationship building, uh, particularly um, at the secondary level. Um, so the students, again, as I mentioned in the um, equity walks, did a feel a, a sense of uh, a safe and supportive classroom environment, but thinking about some of those other um, public spaces um, at the secondary level, um, there was some um, uh, areas uh, for concern and areas for growth uh, coming out of the surveys. So the report also outlined, looked at some data, some MCAS data that you've seen in the past. And I think this is also consistent with past equity audits um, that looked the past um, equity audit that also looked at um, the performance of particular subgroups. Um, with black students consistently being um, the lowest percentage of students meeting or exceeding expectations in ELA, um, math performance varied greatly depending on the student subgroup. Um, our students with disabilities also um, had the lowest percentage um, meeting or exceeding expectations across MCAS exams. Um, when we looked at advanced um, coursework and completion of advanced coursework, um, advanced coursework, there were higher percentage of students in subgroups accessing advanced coursework in math versus ELA. Um, one of the things we discovered in the way this is reported to the state, in ELA, there are only two ways to be categorized as advanced coursework, and that's taking advanced placement, either taking advanced placement English literature or language. In math, there are many more options. So if you take pre-calculus honors, um, if you take an AP course, if you take calculus um, honors. So there's just, and there's like a list of 20 courses that count towards advanced placement. So um, it would be, it's interesting for us to dig a little further deeper to see if there's really um, any difference or is there just, just a wider array of courses and students are accessing more of those courses because there's just more availability and choice. So that's something for us to consider, as well as to consider um, are, are, are we providing enough access for students to reach AP English um, as well for us to think about. Um, some recommendations um, for a review of the data included looking at our internal data. Um, the July 10th meeting, we will have some end of year data for ELA and math as we've been reporting beginning, middle, and end of year data. So we'll be sharing some of that data um, as well. And we, I know you'll see that there's been a lot of growth as well as some areas um, of continued need. Um, and so that, how, what does our internal um, formative and summative data show beyond MCAS? Um, there was an, a place between 2021 and 2022 where our African American students made great impressive growth in ELA. Um, you'll notice those are pandemic years. The, there were changes to the MCAS assessment. We're curious if that had an impact on this. I think this is an area where working with the leadership team, we need to say well, what happened during those years and what could be factors um, for that um, growth that happened between 21 and 22. Um, and really thinking about what are the specific um, actions and steps um, that we can do, uh, can put into place at the high school that will support um, completion of advanced courses. Um, we do believe that some of the initial steps we're taking towards dual enrollment at the high school um, will provide, because dual enrollment will count as advanced placement, um, a designation um, as collected by the state. Um, and really the goal of advanced placement, it's, it's just a, um, an ability to tell our students, hey, this is college level course, and if you wanna go to college, you can do college level work, and this is what it looks like. And so that you're prepared um, when you get to college about the level of work and intensity and requirements. Um, so um, I think that dual enrollment already is a first, um, a nice next step that I think will help us um, broaden um, the scope of students who can access advanced coursework. 
And finally, some next steps, um, not in the report. Um, what we hope to do in um, the fall is come to, back to you with some goals, some very specific goals and some action steps as we dive into the document as a leadership team and with different um, groups to really understand um, the recommendations and how we use the information to move forward. That said, we're not standing still. There are lots of things that are in motion um, and that are beginning to happen in preparation um, for next year. Um, the first is um, working with the leadership team um, and working with someone who will work with the leadership team all year long, um, once a month to really help us think about um, how do we further the goals um, and the steps and the findings in this plan um, with the team. So working with our leadership team, how do we support um, our equity teams and our schools and the goals that we have in the schools um, and some of the, help us move forward in some of the findings um, in this um, document. Um, I'll let Katie talk about the inclusion fellows. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, work underway. Um, so uh, we have a group um, of about 15 um, inclusive practice fellows who will be working this summer on uh, developing um, some professional development for their peers in the fall. And so we'll be working with um, Emily Pat, who's an inclusive practice facilitator um, from the North Shore. Um, she works for the SEAM Collaborative. Um, so we'll be meeting with her in August, um, but the teachers are engaged in some pre-work um, this summer. And then um, this fall, um, we'll also um, be working with additional uh, practitioners around culturally responsive practices. So kind of marrying that universal design for learning uh, with culturally responsive practices. And I, the goal of that group will be to be like teacher leaders, where they're creating classrooms that um, tr are trying, trying out these practices that can be model classrooms for others, and as well as be teacher leaders along with their principals. Um, and sort of helping to share the information they're learning in small chunks to the staff, um, but really sort of help spread the, um, the ways that this can happen in their classrooms um, among their colleagues. So our hope is they become a cohort of leaders who create and curate examples of what this looks like in actual practice. Because sometimes this is also, I mean, much of this work, it feels theory, theory um, and then you're like, well, how do I make this happen with my students in front of my classrooms? And so here's a group of folks we're asking, hey, try this um, and give us feedback about what it looks like and then share it with your colleagues. So um, that's our hope with, um, with that group. Um, with our um, Kelly Larkin, our human resource coordinator, um, we hope to strengthen and sort of really document um, our recruitment and hiring and retention. Um, and really um, our goal, our long-term goal, um, hopefully by the end of next year is to create a, a human resource handbook that really outlines those processes and procedures and really furthers um, the practices um, that are happening in pockets um, but they need to be systemized um, across all of the schools and hiring teams um, that are in place. I think in addition, not on the slide, um, we know that um, we also need to do a deep dive into our special education programming. Um, when Dr. Cataldo gets started, one of the things I'd like to ask her is about how to do an audit of our special education programs, um, potentially a program evaluation that really outlines what are the programs um, in the schools? How do we make sure that we're supporting students between transitions? What are concerns of families and parents? Um, and what are, and hearing from them, both through surveys and some focus groups and really documenting that. So we can really outline some next steps um, and some action steps to help us really um, set up um, a, a permanent executive director of student services with here's where we are, it's same kind of process, here's where our special education programs are, here are the things that are working really well, and here are some next steps to help further and deepen and, and strengthen the program. So um, I think that also comes across, you see some um, little bit of special education sprinkled in within it, um, but we really need to do a deeper dive just specifically to special education through um, my, the best means to do that is through a program evaluation, but I'm waiting for Dr. Cataldo to start in July to have a conversation about what are her thoughts about the best way um, to do that um, um, and get fresh eyes and perspectives because um, there's work to be done there as well. So um, I think that's an, an additional component that I think we should add there as well. I think that's it. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? 
this the time to share thoughts? Yeah. Sure, yeah. I've got some thoughts. <laughs> uh, I have a few of them. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that this is uh, what I was con just because I was confused while looking at it and reading it. This is an audit, not a plan. We've looked at a lot of plans this year: the technology plan, the PD plan. The, um, so this is this is a snapshot of where we are, mm -hmm. uh, which is very was helpful to me in sort of how I process it, uh, and just more mostly just like questions uh, going through uh, when we do make a plan. I think. Neuro neurodiversity, Dr. Evans already spoke to this point, but I think neurodiversity really needs to be included in it, as well as the LGBTQ students, which really aren't very visible in the audit. Um, in the section where it talks about discipline, uh, and it says, it sort of jumped out at me that most of the kids who are disciplined are high needs, uh, which is sort of a catch-all with uh, special ed and low income and uh, other types of racially, you know. It's sort of a catch-all phrase, but the I noticed that it said that those are the students who are disciplined for infractions, which doesn't, to me, doesn't say that the high-risk kids are the only kids who are breaking the rules. They're the kids that, without these sort of self-advocacy skills and um, the getting away with its skills, yeah. uh, I think that should be part of how we look at this. Um, there was also, I think, on. Oh, the uh, Katie was talking about the publics versus the classroom spaces in the schools. I just want to point out there's, I don't think there's a magical difference between the spaces. Really, the magical difference is the amount of supervision the kids get in those spaces. And to me, when it says that kids are behaving differently towards other, towards their peers in spaces where they're supervised closely, like in a classroom, or less supervised, like in a lunch or the hallway, that that's when they sort of learn the norms of behavior, but haven't internalized them. And that's sort of the work that we have to do, uh, is because it's really about what how kids behave when people aren't looking. Um, yeah, and then, sorry, I have my little list. Um, It'd be interesting when the surveys that identified kids, sort of uh, kids self-identified as not belonging, and then more kids identified knowing that there are students who don't belong and don't feel the belonging in school. Anything we can do to identify who are the groups of kids who are missing, we sort of labeled, I've labeled LGBTQ and neurodiverse kids, but I'm sure there are more buckets that we're not doing. And I'm... Oh, and just a question about accessing the advanced coursework. I was wondering if scheduling uh, continues to be part of that issue. And the, there's sort of the, mm -hmm. the accessing it, but then there seems we've gotten a lot, talked a lot this year about just the scheduling as something that limits kids. Um, yeah, something for yeah. Us to consider. Yeah, those, those are all just like random thoughts. Yeah, out there, one so. of the things <laughs> that we need to do on an annual basis, I think, is do a school climate survey mm -hmm. that just is just part of our practice, mm -hmm. both that includes students, families, um, and staff. Um, and so generating a good questionnaire, and that questionnaire can change from year to year. We can tweak the questions mm -hmm. and see what questions work. Um, but um, just instituting that so that we're getting feedback on what are the concerns at all levels about how do you feel around your school climate and your um, inclusion in this climate. So it just needs to be part of our practice and having the principals and others on their team use that data to inform their next steps, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, what are the, what are you going to do with that information to be responsive to the concerns? So if we, we hear concerns from students about the hallways, you know, we have to take steps, yeah. right, to, to address that um, and getting feedback about whether the things we're trying are actually working and having yeah. impact. So I think that's an important next step. Um, address is set, it's, it's clearly set in the audit, but something we absolutely need to do. Yeah. I just know there are, I mean, there are several sort of highlighted incidents this year that took place in public mm -hmm. at public such settings against LGBT kids. So mm -hmm. I'd like just point that out of the not so much focus on like academic or non-academic, but really supervised, non-supervised. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank Thanks. you. Anyone else? I have right. something else. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. This is, this is really good recommendations, and thank you to everybody who um, put so much work and care into this over the year. Um, I think Dr. Adams addressed um, some of my concerns, and that was just that the students with disabilities, they're our largest marginalized group in our district, and 
So I'm glad to hear that um, you're looking at doing an equity um, audit or of there or just an, a, a audit of that department. I do, would just encourage that we get parents and they come, maybe students involved in that as well, um, because they, you know this group is more than well qualified to look at things like MCAS that, um, discrepancies and sc scores, but the softer things like the, whether you belong or not and um, whether you feel welcome in school. That's it, I didn't feel like they necessarily had a voice in this particular audit. Um, so I think that's there's a lot to dig into here, and then if you, if you're doing a, an audit of the special education department, but I just encourage reaching out to CPAC and making sure that the parents and students are rep represented in that. Yep. And Allie. Um, yeah, my comment is, is similar to that. And first, thank you. This is a ton of work, and I think it does give us some really good direction and some place to focus. I thought it was really interesting when you asked about voice and choice and to what Katie was talking about. And um, it was somewhat consistent, but there were minor differences between what the teacher said than what the student said and what the parent said. And I think when you dissect that, um, there might be some really good places to dig in, and especially within the different groups, because there were large groups of students who said they did feel they had a voice and they were able to um, have some input into the choices, but then there were slivers that you suddenly see where students were saying they didn't, and I think when you look at which groups they are, there might be some patterns there. And just to speak to while we're putting kids in sort of the buckets of this, just understanding a lot of the kids with special needs are also LGBTQ. A lot of, you know, are, there's a lot of intersectionality to all these groups, so. It's, I, I often fall into the mistake of thinking of them as separate groups, but they're not, so. I think that it's important to note this is, this is a first step, not the end of the journey. <laughs> um, next, we'll you know, take the next step, um, including um, supporting our leadership team, um, the beginning of some teacher leaders who can help support and initiate the work, um, a deeper dive into our special education programming, um, a school climate survey that'll give us feedback um, and asking um, the leadership team also to look at this feedback and start to identify some next steps, some immediate next steps, um, you know, short term and also long term. So um, please expect in the fall um, some short term goals that probably will just be a year um, to, you know, how, where we're going to get started. Um, and then maybe in subsequent years, we can plan for maybe two to three years um, moving forward as we as we get the team going. And um, so this is the first of sort of next steps as we keep moving towards um, the goals, the real goal of making sure that all of our students have a strong sense of belonging in all of our classrooms all of the time and have equal access um, in all of our, in, in it's every student. And our neurodiverse, our students with disabilities, our African-American, our Latinx, our Asian, um, and our LGBTQT plus um, all of our students. So, and that's the commitment of myself, the leadership team um, as we move forward. Yeah, and it, at being part of a team, um, we started doing the work as a district in 2021. Um, and I appreciate that you have prioritized this when you came on, you brought in a new coach with a, a new vision and a new set of eyes. Um, and I think it's, um, I'm really appreciative of Katie Roberts, all the time that you put in and the, the entire team. Um, we meet um, at least monthly. So it is a process that has been going on for a long time. Um, I appreciate that you will be doing the school climate surveys. Um, one of the things that we did a couple years ago, we did the um, courageous conversations and that was really eye-opening to hear about um, the students' uh, perspectives and their experiences and trying to figure out how we continue to um, understand that and, and um, update our practices. And I think it's, it's constantly evolving. We constantly have to um, do an audit, figure out what we're gonna do to change, and then reassess. And it's just, it's gonna be a constant process, as you mentioned. So I appreciate that. All right. Um, all right, so that was uh, superintendent's report. So we'll move on to item number five, um, communications received by the superintendent. Do you have anything to report? No, okay. Um, student communications 5.2, we don't have any students here. So I'll move to 5.3, other communications. Anyone on the committee have anything to add? No, okay. 
All right, so um, moving on to item six, unfinished business, we don't have any. So I will move on to item seven. Um, so we did 7.1, uh, the handbooks earlier, and we did 7.2 on the evaluation. 7.3 is to receive an update on social studies program review and act as appropriate. This was on our agenda last time. We had to table it. We have to table it again one more time. Um, so bit hoping to get an update on that at our July meeting. Um, so we'll move on to 7.4 to discuss fee on summer school pilot and act as appropriate. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Adams, you're taking us through this or if Aisha will be. No, this is um, Katie. The, Sorry. This is to establish a fee um, for um, a program called Edgenuity. Edgenuity is a program where students can take a course online. Um, so if you need, um, and it, it's being used for credit recovery. So say you haven't been successful during the school year and you need to take Algebra One, you traditionally would send you off to summer school somewhere um, to find um, a summer to make up the credit um, and be able to pass the course. This allows a student to take the online course, um, be able to meet the requirements through different assignments and assessments, including learning the content, um, and then um, be able to um, move forward in their course sequence. This would establish a fee um, for the course. I think it's important for high schoolers to have some skin in the game, both in the families as well. Um, to be able to pay something for it. It would help us cover the costs of the program. HEF is funding um, a coordinator for the program that will help sort of provide some guidance to the students, make sure they're on target to meet the course requirements um, and um, meet um, the assessment requirements and be able to finish the course to meet credit recovery. Um, this is a program that's used statewide um, it's very popular. It's a different way to do summer school in a different time. We live in a different age where online access to courses is, is much easier. Um, the coursework is much more well-developed than it was even five years ago. Um, thanks, I mean, I think it's one of the positives of the pandemic. There's just much more content um, and information online. Um, the fee is consistent with, we, the team looked at other fees across the state um, so it's pretty consistent with what's available, what's being charged um, locally. I, I use that genuity at my day job. It's uh, a, it's very good for credit recovery. I yeah. So our hope is to pilot it. If it goes well, it's something that we can continue to do use during the school year for kids who might be struggling, um, who are out of school for. Um, medical reasons or um, need to our anxiety or school avoidance there are, uh, there are other uses during the school year as well um, but we're going to start it in the summer and see how it goes that's great how, how much coordination do we think is needed we're going to i know have this play weekly check-ins so the coordinator will check okay. in with the students uh, weekly so um, okay because I know sometimes the way the program works is you'll hit a point in the course where a teacher needs to check it before you can move on. So that might stymie the kids. So we depend on how much overview it is. Like mm -hmm. where we do, we just, we have kids with no boundaries. So we just get text messages at home from kids mm -hmm. saying update yeah, our ingenuity. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I don't think that's what teachers here want. <laughs> yes, so the, co the coordinator yes. will be responsible for, for weekly check-ins. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, all right. So. I I believe we have to vote on this, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Motion. Um, motion to approve the proposed fee of $200 per course for students participating in the Ingenuity Credit Recovery Program. Second. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Matt? Aye. Allie? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jen? Aye. Carrie? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right, thank you. Um, okay, 7.5, oh, to discuss grants and donations and act as appropriate. This is the one I was thinking that this is going to be probably Aisha taking us through. Right. No, this one is on hold. On hold. Oh, yes. Okay, got it. That's, Which one? That's the HEF. Oh, grants. No, but and the, there's we, a METCO one too. Yep, there is a METCO, a METCO one. Grant. So that, we got a 15,000 grant from METCO, okay. and that one will be used to fund um, the equity work being done this year. I think to highlight, this yeah. was um, a very competitive pro um, process. The Medco received 
um, much more grant um, money uh, applications than they had funding for. So we're grateful for the amount that um, was allocated um, as part of their racial equity and inclusion grant from METCO. Um, the funding will be used to support um, the work with the leadership team on a monthly basis, um, meeting to facilitate some smaller groups to help us um, support the findings um, implementing the findings of the equity audit, um, as well as the goals of the strategic plan um, around equity and inclusion. So we're grateful for that um, funding through that going. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Any questions? Have we heard anything about the Metco funding to expand or Metco expansion next year? We haven't heard that. Um, I did hear from um, Amy um, Jackson that um, it looks like the increased funding is not making it to the Senate's budget or the, the final budget. Okay. Um, there was just a notice today um, that the Senate, um, they, the budget just came out of conference committee um, and was going to the executive branch. Um, there was some conversation that the governor is out of the country and they're not sure when it will be looked at, but I haven't had a chance to see if that actually made it. But uh -huh. the last I had heard is that that additional funding was not in the final um, proposal that went okay. to the final budget, but um, we'll see. Thanks. So it doesn't look hopeful okay. at this point. But. Sorry, I should have stayed on the good news. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know. You never know. Um, it wasn't hopeful about a week ago, okay. so I don't know what that final budget looks like. Um, um, I'll make a motion to accept a grant of $15,000 provided by Metco Inc. for the purpose of funding a professional development racial equity inclusion grant. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Matt? Aye. Allie? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jen? Aye. Carrie? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right, thank you very much. Um, Okay, so the last item on new business is 7.6. So Dr. Adams and I uh, sat down to talk about um, school committee meeting dates. So you have a draft in your packet. Um, we typically do every two weeks, but there are some meetings I just wanna highlight that are kind of back-to-back -back and um, September's back-to-back -back meeting because Yom Kippur is September 25th. So we wanted to be respectable of that and decided to, um, to schedule the back-to-back -back due to that. Um, but because of that, um, we thought we could put our uh, planning session, which we typically do as a Saturday session, um, right kind of in the middle of that. So it, it would be the end of September instead of early October this year. And then uh, March 12th, I wanted to know, is a Tuesday night meeting, uh, as March 11th is the first night of Ramadan. Um, and then, April 29th is our town meeting. We have a meeting scheduled for the following week. Um, that's one week later, so that um, it's a couple days after town election if there are new members of the committee to, um, to come on board, we would be able to do that right away. Um, so does anybody have questions or comments, feedback on the schedule? I think we also, um, you'll see that October 16th, we hope to um, do the meeting at Medco Inc., um, which is a, a practice that Medco, as um, many Medco districts are doing once a year, is doing the meeting in Boston, um, inviting families, um, Medco families to participate. Um, and so um, we're hopeful to be able to do that on October. Thank you. Now, do we typically put July and August on this calendar too? I can add it on. Yeah. So we've got our meetings uh, July 10th and then August 7th. We're going to do those both at 5 p.m. And I will make sure I remind everybody. Um, and then the last meeting in August will move back to 7 p.m. So I will. Um, I'll add that to this. Okay. Do we? Typically, we don't typically vote on it, right, Carrie? On what? On the, the calendar? On the calendar. Do we vote on it? Yes, we do. Oh, we do. Okay. Yes. On this calendar? On our meeting calendar? On the meeting calendar? Because I didn't put yep. it to act as appropriate. Um, it's okay. Okay. You don't need yeah, to. Yeah, we don't need to. Okay. Um, so how do we want to proceed? Does 
D does everybody feel comfortable voting on it tonight or do you want me to update this and send out a revision and vote on it in July 10th? Fine to vote. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'll make a motion to approve the school committee meeting dates for the 2023-2024 school year as amended with adding the July and August dates. Okay. I'll second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Matt? Aye. Allie? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jen? Aye. Carrie? Aye. And I'm an eye as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So item eight is uh, subcommittee and project reports. Uh, Matt, start with you. I attended the half uh, end of year social, oh, which fun. was very nice. Okay, nice. That's my only update. That's a good one. <laughs> Allie? Um, Climate Action Committee has a meeting on Wednesday night via Zoom. And then we have our policy meeting on July 6th coming up. And there is a Hingham Arts Alliance end of year meeting on July 13th. Um, I went to the SNAP meeting, uh, which was last Tuesday, 13th. And I also, we had the educational program, I'm looking at Allie like she's, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, and we also had the educational programming subcommittee where we went over the equity uh, audit last Thursday. Okay. Jen? Um, we had a finance subcommittee on June 16th, which was a little over a week ago. And there are signed warrants in the back of it. Carrie? Salary negotiations met on June 14th with Unit B. Um, and we have a couple of other strategy meetings coming up, or one coming up on 710, which will be um, salary negotiations with full participation of the school committee. Um, and then we'll be meeting again with Unit B on July 25th and with Unit A on August 30th. Okay. Thank you. And um, I don't have anything. So we'll move over to item nine, anything under 48 hours? No. Um, before we move on to 10, there are uh, notations about the next school committee meeting. As Carrie mentioned, on July 10th, we will um, join, it's a salary negotiation subcommittee meeting with full participation of the school committee. So we will join in an executive session and then our regularly scheduled meeting will start at five um, our August 7th meeting is at five and, um, yeah, that's it. So, um, we are going to adjourn to executive session and not to return to open meeting. So does somebody want to make a motion? I will make a motion to adjourn to executive session pursuant to Mass General Law, chapter 30A, section 21A3, not to return to open session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. For HEA Unit A teachers and Unit B paraprofessionals as an open meeting may have a detrimental effect in the bargaining position of the public body. And the chair so declares. I so declare. And to approve minutes of the executive session held on June 12, 2023 as open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body. And the chair so declares. I so declare. Somebody want a second? Second. All right, roll call vote, Matt. Aye. Allie? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jen? Aye. Carrie? Aye. And I'm an I as well. All right, thank you.